Are you ready to take your first steps towards financial freedom by investing in property? Maybe you've started your portfolio but need some help continuing to grow. Lachlan Vidler and the team at Atlas Property Group are here to help. As experts in property investment, Lachlan and his team are ready to help you take advantage of some of the best investing conditions in almost 20 years. By completing the research, sourcing and negotiations, Lachlan goes the extra mile to find you a high-performing investment and set you on your path to financial freedom. Book in your free discovery call today at atlaspropertygroup.com.au. This is a Momentum Media production. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Good day, how are you going? Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. Hope you're well. Uh, hope you're getting stuck into 2022. Well, we're now into the second month, and already it feels as though uh, Christmas ain't too far away. Uh, it's going to be here pretty quickly, and I think this year is going to be uh, one of those years with a lot of moving parts. Uh, we're recording this. We're actually going to air. On, I don't really like timestamping these podcasts because I'm not too sure when this one's going to be coming out, but I imagine it's over the next week. Uh, so it's okay. We go to air on the morning of the first Tuesday in February. And as you all know, uh, those of you who are armchair economists, uh, this is the day, the first Tuesday of every month is when the Reserve Bank of Australia gets together to work out what they're going to do with interest rates. I've been getting a lot of commentary coming to my inbox over the last day or so and my own uh, readings around it. The whole question around rate rises is is on everyone's lips at the moment. My view, uh, interpretation of the situation right now, you need to think back to what the Reserve Bank was saying last year. They were talking about interest rates not shifting to 2024. Now, towards the back end of 2021, a lot of the markets started talking about, oh, it's going to be a little bit closer than that. Uh, Now, as we come into 2022, there's people sort of saying that there may be rate rises uh, this year and some people calling August. uh, I don't think it's the problem by doing this. You're not going to see a rate rise today. Uh, It's too early still. The RBA want to see wage growth, considerable wage growth, sort of three plus percent. You're not seeing that yet. We're still working out what's going on with this COVID virus. So I'm going to put it out. There's no interest rate rises today and not for the foreseeable future. When we get to the back end of the year, maybe we'll start seeing something. And if it happens, it'll probably happen pretty quickly. Who knows? We'll cover this and follow it. And uh, there's a lot of commentary around it. So I'll get someone to come and have a yarn around it. But um, keep an eye on this sort of stuff. My recommendation is that irrespective of what happens with rate rises, you need to ensure as a property investor that you can afford to pay for your mortgages. The banks have probably put a whole bunch of fat in there in terms of your serviceability anyway, looking at if you're paying your rates at 6%. However, it's not the responsibility of the banks to work out whether or not you can pay your mortgage. It is your responsibility to work out whether you can pay your mortgage. So invest within your means. Uh, This is a theme that we've had for many years on the Smart Property Investment Show. Probably investors sort of giving their sense of what's going on, how they're going about doing it, what works, what doesn't work. And it's something that I really enjoy getting stuck into, having those conversations. Today is going to be no different. Joining me in the studio from all the way from sunny Tasmania, the boom place of Australia would appear right now, Chris Season. Chris, how are you going? You well? Yeah, good. Thanks, Phil. Fantastic. Great to be on here. So you're sitting there, you're nervous about interest rate rises? Not really nervous. I'd say it's obviously property is a long-term hold, and I think it's a moving feast at the moment. But I think as long as you pick your assets well, you you keep a close eye on things, manage your cash flow, um, yeah, I'm not too worried about things. Mm, Yeah, it's... um you know, very sage uh, wisdom there. You're in control of this sort of stuff. Uh, you should be factoring in uh, rate rises into your portfolio now. And if you're not, start doing it. Uh, but keep an eye on what's going on. Tasmania, Chris. Yeah, everyone, absolutely. Everyone who's got property in Tasmania is smiling at the moment. Uh, everyone thought sort of four or five years ago when there's a whole bunch of investment there, it was probably one of the only places in Australia that was actually shifting upwards into gear. And everyone thought it had done its dash, but this COVID thing is uh, ensuring there's a lot of intrastate migration. Tassie's pretty popular. Whereabouts are you in Tasmania? Yeah, absolutely. We're based in Hobart, so southern Tasmania, and um, our investment portfolio is northwest Tasmania. Okay, so you only invest in Tassie? That's it? Correct. Are you yeah, Tassie correct. born and bred? I am, yes. Okay. Is it nice down there? I love it. I yeah. love it. I think it's fantastic. You know, growing up compared to now, it, I think it's a very different city. You know, growing up, I'd start to see signs of change and economic development, gentrification. Yes, I, I absolutely love the place. 
Yeah, it's uh, the handful of times I've been to Tasmania, to Hobart, and I think it officially is part of Tasmania as well. Is King Island part of Tasmania? Sure is. So, yeah, that's a great spot. Uh, I nearly bought some property down there once, but um, didn't, wish I did. But anyway, we won't talk about that right now. But uh, it's a great place. I can see why a lot of Australians are eyeing Tasmania as a potential place to call home as the way in which we work continues to change the knowledge economy for those people who can work from home. It's really interesting. A lot of the readings I've been having lately, already they're talking about, oh, people want to get back to the office. People work from home are being overlooked for career progression, people that work from home are getting disconnected from the workplace and commoditize themselves. So this is going to be an ongoing discussion moving forward. But I think the reality is, is that forever now moving forward, the way in which we work has changed. And therefore, I could see areas like Tasmania, which in some ways is a lot more affordable than the rest of the country, will attract people. Can you see it changing in Hobart if you sort of you know, lurk around the, the bars and the discotheques or the coffee shops or the restaurants of, of Hobart, you've seen sort of more city slickers from Sydney and Melbourne sort of around town? That's a good question. Um, I can't say I personally have. Maybe that's a sign that I don't go out enough. Mm. But, you know, I, I definitely think there's been some internal migration going on, you know, people moving from mainland Australia. But I think there's just a general feel that, you know, people do at the moment feel it's a, a little bit of a safe haven. Mm. Yeah. And are the locals and, you know, you've been there all your life, um, are they happy about this or they're like, well, no, we quite like it how it was and uh, we don't want to change it too much, uh, much like people in Byron Bay who lament now that they've lost their way of life uh, because it's one of the most popular places in Australia has been now a tourist trap. Absolutely. Definitely depends who you talk to. Mm. You know, I would say that, you know, as with any, any regional area, any places that are coastal as well, you're going to see these changes happen. And yeah, like I said, I think it depends depends who you talk to. And, you know, for better or worse, that is just the way that things change as well. Yeah. No, interesting. It's um, that is a cool spot, which probably should drill down a little bit more on it on our Smart Property Investment Show. We do cover it quite a lot on smartpropertyinvestment.com. Do you go and check it out, see what's going on. So, Chris, what, what do you do, mate, for a living? What happens down in Tasmania other than investing in property? My background is community services. Um, for about 15 years, I've worked in the sector, so working across disability and health and primary health and homelessness and youth. And at the moment, I'm a project manager working on some health literacy work. Okay. So that sounds like it's a bit more academic now, but have you ever sort of done a lot of sort of frontline community service work? No doubt that's been part of your, your journey to doing what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Frontline community work has been a large part of my life for the last 15 years. And the reason why I've done that is because it gives me a much deeper insight into, you know, the lived experience of people that need to access services in the community. Mm. Is it sort of, um, I know that there's probably quite a lot of uh, satisfaction out of the work that you've done so far, but you must just sit there sometimes and shake your head and just go, how's it just end up like this for some people? And, you know, more should and could be done. And, you know, then you sort of start thinking about whether the government's doing enough. Is that like a the dichotomy of the job? Yeah, absolutely. Social justice is a large part of sort of, I guess, my mindset and a lot of the people that I surround myself with. So it's definitely a, like an ongoing internal conversation about how can we do more, you know, as a as a country, as a state, as a community to just help people in need. Cause there's a lot of there's a lot of stories out there that, you know, will break your heart. Yeah. And there's uh, there's a lot of reasons for uh, the circumstances that people find themselves in. But I, I guess in my very sort of generalized view of this, uh, having some people within my family that that is sort of quite deep in this sort of stuff is that a lot of it's generational. And you see the cyclical nature of uh, those people who find themselves in, in distressing or, or uncertain circumstances, and it just propagates itself and happens again and again and again and again. And it comes a lot down to education, right, and how, you know, you can help support that next generation so you don't see that same cyclical nature outside of the scope of this podcast. But I guess where the relevance is is around education and, you know, knowledge can help affect and influence change, whether that's through social work, but also through property investing itself. The best investors I know, uh, Chris, is um, those that sort of double down on understanding and, and getting better at understanding and, and the knowledge around uh, property investment before they sort of take a lot of action. No doubt sort of you coming through the traps of the property investor, have you really invested on the education side of things? Yeah, absolutely. That was a massive part of our journey. We only got into the property game pretty recently in uh, late 2019. And right from the start, we decided we wanted to understand this very well, you know, as, as best as we could. And that really started with learning a lot of research around podcasts and Facebook groups and YouTube videos and just trying to 
immerse myself in all the knowledge and information out there, you know. At one point, I was spending about probably 12 hours a day. I had a bit of time off between jobs and I ended up spending 12 hours a day just trying to soak up as much knowledge as I could. Well, wow, that's pretty good investment in uh, uh, time to be better informed and educate yourself around it. And no doubt the Smart Product Investment Show is part of that. But you talk about we. Who's the we? You and the wife? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So okay. uh, my wife, she's the other half of this team. And, you know, I, I think that teamwork is a massive part of uh, any successful property journey. Mm. Is it a balanced team or is uh, one, one of you the sort of the driver and the other one sort of more the passenger or you, you're in it together and do different things? It's definitely a team effort. We sort of focus on different things. So my wife has this incredible vision to see potential in things that other people might not. And I like to go really detail focused. So for me, I get irrationally excited about bookkeeping, for example. Okay. Well, that's a bit weird, but uh, I know some people <laughs> would absolutely love that. Are you a technical sort of person? Are you a spreadsheet type of person? I love my spreadsheets. Yeah. Yeah. Are they sort of perfect, exactly the same font, same font size, uh, same absolutely everything? Are they sort of pristine? Yeah. I think you're kind of um, drilling down into the type of personality that I might have. Yeah, I'm picking it up straight away. But <laughs> it's really funny. I'm a bit the same, but you know, I'm sort of a bit the same across a whole bunch of things. But you, know, you speak to anyone inside of this business or anyone who sort of operates inside of the, the portfolio that we have on a smart property investment, they will know an absolute stickler to spreadsheets. And, you know, if everything isn't absolutely perfect, I just assume there's a mistake. Uh, so I won't even look at something until it's absolutely perfect because then I know there's been a certain attention to detail put to it. And then no doubt the numbers therefore are likely to be more accurate because I think it's just one of those things. Maybe I'm wrong or right. Who knows? But um, but good administration management is an important pillar of property investment, as is actually seeing what the future looks like and how do you extrapolate value out of different properties. So you said that the whole of your portfolio is in Tasmania. Just give me some sense of how, how many properties in your portfolio, Chris? So we've got our PPOR and then we've got six investment properties. Okay. That's pretty good going. So PPOR, principal place of residence, is in Hobart? Correct, yes. And then you've got six investment properties in northern area of Tasmania. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, spread out across the coast. Okay. I really want to unpack that. Uh, what we'll do is go to a break beforehand. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Looking for a blue chip Gold Coast investment property or trying to relocate to the beautiful sunny Gold Coast but keep missing out on the right properties? Maybe you need an expert on the ground to source the right property for you. The Srama Group are the leading recommended buyers agency specific to the Gold Coast, providing their clients with exclusive off-market property opportunities, specific insights into market, combined with a large network of dedicated professionals to ensure sure you make the right decision without the hassle. Get in touch with us at thesramagroup.com.au and secure your financial freedom today. Welcome back, everyone. It's Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. I'm with Chris Season, chatting through his portfolio. It seems very heavy in Tasmania, but that's probably not a bad idea with some of the growth that Tasmania has seen and probably will still to be seen. Principal place residents in Hobart. Now, pretty much everyone gets a water view in Hobart. How fancy is the principal place of residence? Oh, I wouldn't necessarily call it fancy. but that, That's a really place. sort of descriptive property term, by the way, fancy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, we, so what, what's the PPOR? Is the house? Is the unit? Yeah, three bedroom, uh, two bathroom. So we bought that in 2017 and it was the worst house on the best street. So we renovated that pretty extensively. We were very lucky because my parents-in-law decided to give us a living inheritance. Oh. So this idea that they could actually use their knowledge and time and skills now in order to contribute to something that we could um, grow into the future. I don't mind that as a, a principle. So essentially, rather than sort of waiting around however long it takes for them to um, leave this planet, um, they do it beforehand so they can actually, I guess, show greater utility and then also be part of the journey of the upside of it. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Did, did they come to you for that or did, did you request it? They actually came to us. Mm. Yeah, they thought it was a, a good time to buy. So they actually um, migrated to Australia from Germany and Iran. Uh, so as migrants, they you know learned how to hustle and work hard and build up their own future. And they saw this opportunity for this house that came up. And at the time, you know, we weren't looking at investing or anything like that. We didn't really understand much about the economic landscape. That's sort of our journey began a bit later on. Uh, but yeah, from that decision, we decided to um, buy this place. And yeah, we pretty much gutted it and 
spent probably a good six months working on it. That's cool. And did the inheritance come by way of just a chunk of cash for a deposit? Is that pretty much what it was? No. So um, we funded the deposit ourselves. Okay. The, the living inheritance came through the skills and the, the knowledge from my, particularly my father-in-law, you know, a bit of a jack of all trades. And so we became sort of trades assistants and helped out and supported a lot of the journey there. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. So, so you completely redid your principal place of residence. If you don't mind, what, what did you, what did you pay for your PPOR and what do you think it's valued at now? Yeah, we paid two forty five for that property in late two thousand sixteen. It's now valued at about six fifty. Okay, so you've done pretty well out of it, no doubt. You've extracted some equity out of that in order to get going on the property investment journey. Okay, cool, absolutely. So let, let's chat about. Let's go through the portfolio quickly. Uh, property number one, where, whereabouts is it? What is it? Yeah, property number one is in Devonport, Tasmania. Okay. Yeah, so lovely they, place. Yeah, beautiful area. So. This is quite ironic. My wife actually grew up on the same street that we purchased that property. So when this first came up, she knew the area incredibly well. And so with our asset selection, we went street by street and we used a lot of data. We used a lot of local information. So this one is a four bedroom, two bath. We spent about 60K on it, renovating it. We paid 295 for it and it's now valued at 550. 550. When did you do this? 2019? Uh, 2019, yes. 2019. Cool. All right. Nice. So you, you just, so I don't ask you each time, you've never sold a property, you've only acquired property, correct? Or correct. There, okay, cool. All right. So that's still in the portfolio. So that was Devonport number one. What's the second property? The uh, second one is in a place called Olverston, which is just next door to Devonport. And we picked up a lovely two bedroom house uh, on about 800 square meters overlooking the Bass Strait. And we picked that up for 310 and it's now worth about 390. Okay. And you drop any dough on it or did you just leave it? Spent about 15K on it, yep. you know, putting in a heat pump, uh, new lights, painting throughout as well, That's and awesome. new flooring. And did your father-in-law help quite a lot on all these different um, uh, acquisitions and, and reno work? For the first one in Devonport, he did. Yeah. But, um, yeah, for the second one, I'd sort of learned enough skills to go out and do a bit of a cosmetic renovation myself. Uh, so I actually did that all myself. Oh, very cool. And would you fly up there every weekend or was it sort of you went up there and just stay there until you got the job done? It depends. So for the first property, uh, I was lucky to have a work schedule where I was working three days a week. So then I would go out, drive up for the other four days of the week, do some work, come back. Whereas with the second one, I was able to take a big chunk of time off and basically spend two weeks there okay. and buy myself solo doing the reno. How far is it sort of driving from uh, Hobart to Devonport? You're looking at a, a three-hour drive, so it's about 300 kilometres, give or take, you know, 700 kilometres return. Yeah, that's manageable. If you're not doing it overnight, it's probably okay. Uh, so that was probably – so how long after the second property from the first property? Uh, how many months? So the first property was, so December 2019, and then the second property was November 2020. Okay. So you're looking about 11 months. Wow. Okay. So you've really made hay then over 2021. Any sort of COVID impact for you in that period of time from late 19 to November 20? That would have been sort of smack bang in that first, first real spike that we got from March. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It wasn't a huge impact for us because I was actually there for a large period of time and ended up sort of being, um, you know, sort of locked down in the area in terms of, you know, I had no other choice but to renovate. And we were lucky because with that first property, we had a builder who lived in the area uh, that we literally ran across and made friends. And he was really instrumental in helping us get that renovation online. Yeah, no, very cool. Okay. So that was Alveston. Alveston. Sorry, I've got to fix my geography up with Tasmania. I'm, I'm pretty good, but some of the smaller places I'm not too sure about. Okay, what was next, uh, Chris? Uh, the next one was a property in Burnie. Okay. A suburb called Romaine. Yep. And so that was in January 2021. Yep. And we paid 352 and valued at 450 Very nice. All right, uh, property number four. Uh, four was in June 2021, so about five months later. And that again was in Burnie. Yep. And we paid 327 for that. And it's now worth 365. Okay. Uh, property number five. Property number five was November 2021. So about five months later, uh, we paid 297 and it's worth about 335. And where was that? Sorry. Uh, Burnie. Burnie again. Yep. Well, they're going to give you the mayor's going to give you the key to the city there soon. <laughs> uh, property number six. And the final one was uh, December 2021. So very recently, yep. we paid two ninety five, 
and we recently got that valued at three seventy five. Wow! All right, Bernie. Yep, Bernie. Bernie. Wow. There you go. All ha- that that and those last two were houses, obviously. Yeah, yep. correct. Yeah, all, all the properties in our portfolio houses. Houses. Okay. Very nice. So, what what do you think the sort of total valuation, not counting your principal place of residence, what's the total valuation of your portfolio now? Uh, the total, not including principal place of residence. No. It's a very good question. I'm sure your spreadsheet tells you that. Yeah, it does actually. <laughs> do you have a second for me to get that point? I do, right? Go and go okay, and find great. it out. That's um, and and this goes to the point around uh, having numbers uh, close to hand. Um, you know, you should be able to. You might not know on the top of your head, but you need to know where you can go to find it out pretty quickly. And that's what my mm. spreadsheet does for me, no doubt. Same Absolutely. as Chris. The good thing about sort of total valuation for properties is that it gives you a sense of what the LVR is, what the debt position is versus the total valuation. So that's what we can work out. And that's probably where I'm going to go with Chris. What's the number, mate? Mm, 2.5. All right. 2.5 yep. million bucks. There we go. And total debt. Total debt for those properties, not including the PPOR. Not including your PPOR. 1.7. 1.7 million bucks. All right. So you clear about 800K in equity. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Correct. LVR position. What's that? About sort of 68%. Just look at those yeah. numbers. Yep. I'd have 70 for 68, that. 70% LVR. Okay. Are you happy with that sort of position of the portfolio as it is right now from a LVR position and the equity position? Is this where you thought you would be or do you think you're ahead of the game? You've only really started investing back in December 19. So literally you've just marked two years. How do you feel about it all? We're incredibly happy with it because when we first started out, we had a bit of a property plan that we developed and we aimed to hit five to six properties over a five-year period. So we're sort of well ahead of the curve. We actually thought we were doing it a little bit slow. You know, we thought this idea that you need to accumulate fast, you know, we we just thought um, we were a little bit behind the curve there. And you're looking at sort of $800,000 of equity, which over a two-year period is pretty cool uh, to create. How much of that do you think sort of the original cash that you put in versus the equity that you've manufactured uh, Mm. through it just by holding these properties or buying well and getting them valued at a different price? Mm. Yeah. Is is it 50-50? Well, the total cash we put down, including our deposit for the PPOR, was 182. Okay. Yeah, so then you look at the net worth of the assets, you know, the properties minus their liabilities, yeah, yeah. sitting about 850. Yeah, that's uh, it's not bad going, um, you know, with only two years under your belt. And to be fair, you could probably, how old are you guys now, sort of thereabouts? Uh, 37. 37. I'm 37. Yeah. Yep. So sort of mid-30s, you know, you could pretty much stop now, not worry about property again and sort of come back in two cycles time and, you know, I'm thinking of retirement, this would be a very different looking portfolio at that point in time, should you not change your debt position. And, and no doubt there's some sort of long-term strategy through investing in property. What, what is that strategy for you? How are you trying to realise uh, or how do you think you'll realise the wealth that you'll create through property? Yeah, exactly. Well, we're a big fan of long-term buy and hold uh, and being able to renovate to release equity. So one of the things that's important to us is holding this for the long term. The idea is maybe go through one or two property cycles, sell down you know, perhaps half the portfolio, and then that will give you the um, passive income unencumbered for the rest. Mm. And sort of that strategy, which to be fair is pretty sensible and it stood the test of time, uh, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years in property, holding on property for long term and then realising that at a point in time when you need to, but being able to hold that property and we'll have a chat about cash flow uh, in a moment. But in terms of shaping that strategy, have you actually had any uh, professional help through that or is it mainly just listening to podcasts and reading books and and going down that pathway. Uh, How have you shaped that? It's been mostly through the knowledge and the information we've accumulated, which in large part did come from podcasts. So we would spend a lot of time sort of collecting information. And one of the things I did along the way was I set up a, you know, like an online Word document and I'd set up a bit of a glossary. So I would read content and listen to things. And for example, every time I come across a topic such as capital growth, I'd write that down and I'd include that comment. So then I'd start to see patterns and trends emerging. And so in large part, I've sort of like been able to crowdsource a lot of the information that, you know, people around me online that are much smarter than me, um, I've been able to sort of crowdsource that knowledge and use that to help develop our strategy. Do you think it's hard to invest in property? I don't think it's hard, but it's not easy. Mm. So, you know, once you get the fundamentals down pat, 
you know, and I think something that's really important for us at least is we decided to treat it like a business. So right from the start, we set out with a plan. We decided to take it really seriously. We set out, you know, mission, vision, values, talk about tactics as well, just in terms of how we wanted to approach it. So we ended up with a, you know, I guess for use of a better word, a property plan, which had a list of our goals that we wanted to achieve. And then we'd break it down into sort of more manageable steps. And, you know, that ended up over about 10 versions. We ended up with a A4 page document, you know, which we keep on the fridge. Every time we look at it, it keeps us accountable because it's written down on paper and it's um, it, it's a large part of our journey. So what do you think it is, and, and maybe this is, you know, there's no really answer to this question, but looking at how you've gone about building out your portfolio, the assets that you've bought, you know, some things I'll challenge in it, but, but we'll leave that for a moment. But I would largely say you've done this pretty well. Why do you think or how do you think some people get it so wrong? And you only need to look at the numbers that say that, Twenty uh, percent of all Australians are somehow sort of investing in property. Most Australians only ever buy between one or two properties. You've bought six plus your principal place residence in in a matter of years. Why do people get it so wrong? Is it largely because they just don't go through the thorough process of educating themselves? It has to be that, right? I think that's a huge part of it because I think having a clear vision right from the start is so important. You know, I just can't understate that because if you have a clear vision, it just gives you this confidence and courage to then go forth and, and execute that. And, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with people about property and they say, well, I've found this place and it's great. Let's go get it. And I'm kind of like, okay, that's fantastic. But how are you going to get there? You know, tell me why you're doing it. What are you going to do? And what are the steps that you're going to take along that journey to get that? So, Show me your reason, your why for doing it first. Yeah, and and your why is it? Do you have an an idea of what I guess retirement looks for you? When that will happen, or what that will look like? Not too sure about when, because um, we want to keep that sort of open at this stage. But you know, like if we can retire, say ten years early, you know, at the age of fifty five, or even early around forty five to fifty, would be incredible. But for us, you know, investing basically comes down to having freedom to do more things that you want to do. Mm. Uh, and one thing that's important to us is, you know, using this journey to give back to family as well that have supported us in the, along the way. Yeah, it's um, it's not a bad way to view it. I think my observation with retirement is that a lot of people seem to be in a hurry to retire, and they think property is going to be the vehicle for them to fast track that retirement. The irony of it all is that those people that go down that pathway typically work all their life because they find something that they actually largely really enjoy and therefore it's not really a job, it uh, becomes a passion or, or something else. So they end up working their whole life. Um, so don't rush retirement, uh, everyone, but you've got to get on that journey yourself to work towards it before you may have an understanding of appreciation of what that retirement actually looks like. And you look at any property, successful property investor, Chris, and, and you probably know many yourself, they're still at it, even in their 80s, right? They're still mm. they're still out there. They're, they're trading, they're, they're building, they're selling, they're buying, they're maneuvering. They're still in it because they just love the game. So maybe that's what retirement looks like for a lot of people. I actually want to have about uh, chat about that. We've spoken a lot about the equity position, how you've gone about building this portfolio, Chris. I want to sort of see it from a cash point of view. We'll just go to another break. Stay with us back in a moment. The mark of financial success isn't about getting bigger, better, faster, or more. To Paul, success is freedom. Freedom to spend more time with his family, or giving back to his community, or just more time to go surfing. Paul Glossop, an award-winning property buyer and regular guest on the Smart Property Investment Podcast, has taken the lessons he's learned building a multi-million dollar property portfolio and laid them out in his best-selling book, A Surfer's Guide to Property Investing. For a limited time, get your free copy of Paul's award-winning book, and receive a roadmap for building both lifestyle and wealth through property investing. Grab your free copy today at purepropertyinvestment.com. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant from the Smart Property Investment Show with uh, Chris Season, chatting through his portfolio. Now, Chris, we haven't spoken rents on these. Uh, A lot of these are very similar assets. No doubt they all originate the same amount of weekly rent. Can you give me some sense for the position of your portfolio from a you know, a cash sort of framework. Is it positively geared, negative geared, neutrally geared before tax? I'd say it's sitting around uh, neutrally geared, perhaps okay. a little bit negative because our IP expenses are 8500 per month. Our total rental income is 9500 per month. So we're cash flow positive, but we do hold a few interest-only loans. Interest-only loans, yeah. yeah. So let's chat about loans for a moment. So how many 
How many are you sort of paying the principal component off versus uh, interest only? Uh, it's roughly, it's split down the middle. Okay. So we've got, yep. And why are you playing principal on on mortgages when a lot of people are just sort of creating a portfolio or only interest only? We set them up at the time because we would like to pay down some of the principal. We thought it's a nice, safe bet to have them. But as we um, accumulated more properties towards the end of the portfolio, that's when we changed them to interest only because we wanted to have that extra cash flow to put down to pay off the PPOR. Yeah, fair enough. So you're still paying off debt somewhere. You're just sort of channeling in a different way. So is the plan to completely pay off the PPOR? Or is that like a priority for you guys? I wouldn't say it's a huge priority at the moment. We'd like to accelerate that if we could, but obviously, you know, because we're holding six properties in our portfolio in a couple of property cycles, you know, there's definitely scope to pay off one of those assets to pay down the PPOR. So mm-hmm. then it takes the pressure off, off us. What's your, your lending mix look like? You've got seven mortgages, including your PPOR. Have you got them spread across a number of banks or a number of lenders? Yeah, we've got them spread across three lenders, uh, which is a mix of first tier lenders and third tier lenders. Okay. And the third tier lenders, if uh, by way of a phrase, um, why are you with them? Uh, as we got, as we accumulated more in the portfolio, our debt to income ratio was getting pretty tight. So that's when we decided to target third tier lenders because they'd have a, um, a better appetite to take us on board. Yeah. They're a little bit more accommodating. And third tier doesn't mean they're a bad lender, by the way. They just mm. view things differently. They have a different risk appetite to what maybe the major lenders are, and the major lenders being the, the big banks, which you're all familiar with. So all of us at a point in time in our portfolio, we'll, we'll, we'll get to a point where the major banks might go, mm, yeah, I don't want to give you any more debt for whatever reasons they are. However, there is sort of second and third sort of tier lenders. And a lot of the second tier lenders, to be fair, are big banks as well. They're not the major banks. By then, you sort of think of your your Suncorps or your Bank West or those type of lenders. And then you've got more specialised lenders who are more accommodating to people with different uh, income sort of spectrums. Um, and they're, they're just as good. They just view things differently and can be a real boon. Uh, are you sort of tapped out now or, or you're, you're looking to invest more? I think for the time being, we're pretty tapped out. So that's why we're going to sort of sit tight for the next uh, 12 to 24 months, just consolidate the portfolio a little bit, focus on paying some debt down. Uh, But obviously, you know, if we do have an opportunity to pull out a bit more equity and the right opportunity arises, we're pretty keen to um, explore that. Yeah. So have you started speaking to a broker yet around that, trying to think about what that would look like? Or are you just going to just take it easy for a while? We're just in conversations with the broker about sort of balancing the portfolio a little bit. Um, obviously, you come up to sort of a honeymoon period with some of the loans. So, mm. you know, because you, we hold seven mortgages, it's a matter of trying to balance the interest rates across all of those. And you try and line up those dates for a refinance so that you're getting the best bang for your buck. What's your interest rates like at the moment? You've got some principal interest stuff, so no doubt a bit sharper than interest only. And then your interest only stuff will come off at a period of time back in the day. When I started investing, all you had to do was say, yeah, I want to continue with another five years and you just had to sign a bit of paper. Now you need to do a whole new uh, finance application on it, which is a pain, but um, just the way it is right now. Are you getting some sharp rates or you think you're out of the market on some of them? Uh, it, it's a mixed bag. And that's partly comes down to the fact that towards the end of the portfolio, when we went with the third tier lenders, you know, some of the rates are a little bit high. So the highest that we're paying on one of them is 3.79. Okay. Uh, the lowest that we're paying is is um, two point one nine for our PPOR, but uh, three of our investment properties sit with one lender, and we're paying two point five nine percent. Okay, it's not too bad. Hmm. It's not too bad at all. And how do you go about managing these properties? You you've got property managers up in Burnie that look after it all. Or you're back in your car driving three hours each time. No, we have property managers for that. Um, we found a wonderful crew called Hampton Peters Real Estate and they're fantastic. So we've built up a long-term relationship with them and they're great. They just oversee our portfolio. Um, and I think that's probably a really key part of it is developing good relationships with real estate agents. You know, that's another thing I can't understate enough. Um, it just takes away so many headaches in terms of self-managing, particularly for us, because for us, it's a three-hour drive to get to where we need to. We've had plenty of trips up there. I worked out we had 50, 50 drives there and back wow. to the Northwest Coast. At least so, it gave you something to do on the weekends, right? It was fantastic <laughs> because every every trip was a podcast we could listen to. <laughs> so I hope you I hope you didn't listen to me droning on the whole time or is that sort of part of the playlist of the uh, the season's household? 
Uh, listening to your dulcet tones was the best part, Phil. <laughs> well, I do apologise uh, about how uh, annoying that my nasally <laughs> voice can be sometimes. But uh, you know what? I, I get a real kick out of that as well. You know, you're on a, a pathway to uh, wealth creation through property. And the secret of it is it's not hard, uh, is that if you're serious about it, you need to invest time, energy and effort into it. It's not going to happen around you without having to commit to it and putting that hard work and, and 50 car trips, you put the hard work in, um, but more so the education around it. So the information is all out there mm-hmm. and and it's freely and accessibly available. It's what you choose to do about it. You engage it, you consume it, you gain wisdom from it, and then hopefully you can take uh, advantage of it. Uh, that's the idea of it all. Um, and you've got a good accountant and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. We've yeah. definitely got a good accountant, good conveyancer, um, just a team of professionals that we've built up along the way. So that's the other the other thing I'd probably mention is that make sure you've got a good team around you, whether you're doing it solo or with a partner or family. Um, I can't understate, yeah, having having a good team around you will really take you really far because these are professionals and they do it every day in and out. And particularly around buying, like we we love the process of researching and getting out in the car and visiting places, you know, but for someone that doesn't have the time or the inclination to do that, that's where I'd really look at engaging someone like a buyer's agent. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And if you do want to do it yourself, go and do it yourself. And um, to Chris's point there, you've got to put the time, energy and effort into it. If you don't have that inclination or your time poor or you just couldn't be bothered, uh, but you still want to get all the upsides of doing that, there is professionals out there that can help you out as well. As well, Chris, mate, I've really enjoyed the chat. When you go again, come and let us know what's happening. Hopefully, I don't know, this is probably the final question for me. You're pretty heavy in Tasmania, mate. You know, there's other parts of Australia. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It was a big consideration of ours when we first started. But the main reason why we invest in Tasmania is because we know the areas incredibly well, both a mix of data and on the ground. Um, And so because we've learned that process, we could hopefully, touch wood, just apply that to uh, looking at interstate if we wanted to purchase there. And it's definitely on the cards for sure. What will you buy again in Tasmania? It depends. Yeah, I think it's a matter of just watching the market and seeing how things go. Obviously, you know, there are markets within markets right around Australia. So we would be looking to see if there's, um, you know, any hot spots that we'd like to target. That's uh, Chris Season, uh, probably investment from down in Tasmania, mate. Keep up the good work. Um, let us know how you're getting on. And, and thanks for coming to join us today on Smart Point Investment Show. A pleasure. Thanks for having me, Phil. Nice one. Um, hope you enjoy that, everyone. Uh, plenty of other investor stories. Go and check it out, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. If you're a social media person, you can find it all there. You can follow uh, Smart Property HQ and all the social channels. That's how you like to get your info. Please keep those uh, reviews and feedback coming uh, wherever you listen to this. Most of you on the Apple podcast player. Uh, the team get a real kick out of that information. We'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. Looking to refinance your loan for a better rate? Maybe you're considering releasing equity to grow your portfolio or struggling to find a lender that can meet your needs. Finney is the investment finance specialist that has the solution. With access to over 70 lenders, Finney can track down the financing solution you need. We specialize in investment property finance and we only deal with lenders that have the right solutions for investors just like you. So you're in safe hands. Fast track your investment strategy today. Visit finney.com.au for more information.